Welcome back, my friends. Welcome to this session titled Anastasia and the Bringing Cedars Vision for Education. Imagine a world where children grow up in loving families, in lush, beautiful, and abundant acreage, surrounded by neighboring families and communities that all support one another like a traditional village. In this loving space, children are encouraged to look within themselves to find their own innate questions and answers. And if and when they do go to school, their learning occurs by participating in all aspects of the school, from building the schoolhouse, to writing their own textbooks, to creating their own learning path, growing food, preparing their own meals, bookkeeping, decision-making, the direction of all the school's projects. And when it comes to academics, these children can learn as much as 11 years of curriculum in one year. They can earn a master's degree by the time they're 17. And all of this happens while students are invited to freely come and go as they please. This is the vision shared by Anastasia in the famous books from Russia called the Ringing Cedar series. Anastasia's philosophy has inspired millions of readers all around the world. And today we're so very blessed to have with us the founder of Anastasia Foundation. So without further ado, Please help me in welcoming the founder of Anastasia Foundation, the very awesome and very inspiring Gabriel Miguel. Welcome, Gabriel. Hi, Edith. Thank you. It's a pleasure to be here. You're such an eloquent transmitter of this beautiful wisdom. It's such a blessing to have you with us. Could you tell us before your presentation? I know you have a beautiful presentation prepared for us. Before Mm -hmm. we get into it, how did you become Gabriel Miguel, the founder of Anastasia Foundation? Oh, man. I mean, I'm still just Gabriel Miguel, right? And basically how it went is I I found the Ringing Cedars books in 2014. I had been on a spiritual search my whole life. I'm really young. I'm only 27. And 2014, I don't know, how old was I? 18 or something? Uh, 19. And I found the books after lots of spiritual searching and being really discouraged with what I had found and reading all the philosophies and things of the world, all the books of the world. And studying all those religions and things and, you know, loving a lot of things, but not being entirely satisfied. And I came across the books and I remember I devoured them really quickly, probably the first eight books in like two weeks. And um, I, I remember about halfway through the first book, I just held the book in my hand and I was like, wow, I finally found clear and undistorted, pure truth no dogma, no trying to make myself seem great or mysterious, just clear, easy to understand, pure, undistorted truth. And I was like, wow, I couldn't believe it because that's what I'd been searching for. And it was such a miracle just to be with that. And I decided right then and there that I was going to dedicate my the rest of my life to it. And I was going to spread everything from these books across the world and do everything I could to build the community. And so I started with trying to build community online. I made a free internet forum, which is still up somewhere. And uh, it evolved from there. I started meeting people. We started doing events. We did our first event with Latimer McGree in 2016. He's the author of the books, Latimer McGree. Um, we did an event with him in 2016 in New York. He hasn't been back to New York since. Uh, he, he's only come to the United States in the last decade, really, just to see us and do stuff with us, which has been cool. And uh, we're in touch now. I'm going to be republishing the books. We're negotiating that. The books are out of print at the moment. But um, he's really excited about everything we're doing. And so, yeah, I just dedicated my life to building this community. And so we have grown the largest English-speaking Ringing Cedars community in the world. We're barely at the beginning, honestly, in my view of it. And there's a lot more to come. So I just worked really hard and dedicated myself to connecting people connecting readers and people who want to live this way i read these books many years ago it just seems like now is the time now is the right time for us to really live this lifestyle like there there's um there's a time code that got unlocked you know these last yeah. couple of years where there's a mass yeah. scale awakening it's like oh wow yeah. the way we've been doing things really really doesn't work we really have to step into solutions now so i think it had to alchemize like a seed yeah. in us to, that that is starting to sprout and blossom into something beautiful in this time. Right. I couldn't agree more. I could not agree more from being in the movement for as long as I have been 
I have never seen more energy and more momentum for it than I do now. And it's not even comparable to what it was when I first came in almost 10 years ago. Yeah. And to see the fire in the people and in the community for action and how far people have progressed in their understanding of all kinds of things and how they're acting as a community, it's unbelievable. The time is the time is truly now. Beautiful. So I can't wait to see your presentation. Should we share screen? Yeah, absolutely. So this is my presentation, Anastasia and the Ringing Cedars Vision for Education in the New Civilization. And so there's a lot here. And so I want to cover who is Anastasia? What is the Ringing Cedars about? What is this new civilization that I'm talking about? And first of all, I want to thank everybody who's here watching this because we're about to go on an incredible journey. There's a lot of information that I'm going to be covering. So I'm going to try to move through it efficiently. And please remember that you can always come back and watch this replay if you need to, because there's probably going to be a lot of stuff in here and some new ideas and things. And so this picture that you see is the inside of the school that Edith was mentioning in the introduction of a very particular school in Russia. This was designed and built and painted and everything entirely by children. So there gives you a little bit of a preview of what a... Uh, a child with an open heart and and the limits taken off can do. So what is the Ringing Cedars of Russia book series about? So if you look on the right here, these are the second edition of the Ringing Cedars books that most people are familiar with when you read them. And there's 10 books. There's one that's not pictured here. Uh, book 10 is called Anasta. And so what is this about? So the books were written by Vladimir McGree. He was an entrepreneur in Russia. He published them in the early 90s and early 2000, and they have sold more than 30 million copies around the world and have been, pu been published in more than 30 languages. And it's sparked a giant worldwide movement. And so the story goes that Vladimir is, he has boats and ships and he's trading along a river in the high northern area of Siberia uh, on a river in the, in the, uh, called the Alb River in the Siberian taiga, which is basically wild Siberian wilderness of Siberian cedar trees. And so he's sailing on his boat and he stops at a little, very underpopulated village of like 15 people on this remote area way in the middle of nowhere. And he meets a two Siberian elders and they tell him about the existence of something called the ringing cedars. And he's super intrigued by these ringing cedars. Uh, this idea of these ringing cedars. And they say that the ringing cedars are trees that live to be 550 years old. And once they get that old, they say to Vladimir that the cedar is designed to store cosmic energy, all the light and information and everything from the planets and the stars and the sun, the cedar stores them. And at the appropriate time, it's supposed to give it back to humanity. And they, when it stores up enough energy, they start to ring. And you can hear it and it's like a power line, like an electrical crackling sound. And so they're asking Vladimir, can you cut down this ringing cedar we found and give it, give the pieces to people who will benefit from the energy of the street? So he's very intrigued and he decides to come back later to investigate. He can't help them at the moment. So then he comes back, but he doesn't meet the elders. He winds up meeting their granddaughter, Anastasia, who was pictured here. And he winds up spending three days with her. And shortly about her, she's the descendant of what is called the Vedrus culture. It's an ancient culture. And to put it briefly, her family line all the way back to the beginning of time and the first humans ever created have lived separately from the rest of humanity in harmony with God and preserving all the knowledge of our what she calls pristine origins since the beginning of, of time. And she has perfect genetic memory all the way to the first day of creation. And she's able to recall all of these events and share these things, every everything from day one of humanity to now. And it's pretty incredible. And she spends these first three days talking with Vladimir about, um, well, in general, she every time she sees him, she talks about everything in, in life and in our existence, the purpose of mankind, man's relationship with God, man's true relationship with nature, raising children in the image of God creating happy families and creating and what she says, preserving love and families forever. And another idea called kin's domains, which we'll get into. It's the flourishing garden thing that Edith was talking about here. So 
Uh, these are some quotes from Vladimir directly about who Anastasia is. She lives in the forest altogether alone. She has no house to call her own. She hardly wears any clothes and doesn't store any provisions. She's been living separately in a whole different civilization. She and those like her have survived to the present day through what I can only term the wisest possible decisions. She was born here in the taiga and is an integral part of the natural surroundings. And the difference between her and other great prophets or saints or people of the past is that she didn't go separately into the forest for a period of time, like, you know, Buddha or Jesus and Moses. She was born there and she only comes to our world for very brief periods. And um, basically, she has an incredible ability to show images or holograms of what she's talking about in different periods of time. Uh, the images are three-dimensional, complete with the smells and the sounds of the time she's describing. So whenever she's talking to Vladimir, it kind of looks like what you see in this painting on the right. And it's very vivid and it's very easy to recall. It's very powerful. And uh, basically, she preserves the experiences and emotions of the members of her extended family, starting with the creation of the very first human in her genetic memory. And she's able to call them all up at will. And she can also model pictures from the lives of people in the future. So she talks a lot about the future. So she has all kinds of abilities that you would expect a person of that kind of pristine purity to have. Uh, she can teleport. She can do all kinds of things. But that is the main thing. That's not what it is at all. So that's a little bit about Anastasia. And so she spends this time with Vladimir and she tells him in the book you're going to write, there will be unobtrusive combinations, formulations made up of letters, and they will arouse in the majority of people good and radiant feelings capable of overcoming ailments of body and soul and will facilitate the birth of a new awareness inherent in people of the future. And so she tells Vladimir that she he's going to write these books and they're going to spread like wildfire over the world and create a whole new civilization. And without any marketing, without any money spent on advertising or anything, those books have sold 30 million copies. They have started uh, a giant movement, which I'm going to describe to you a little bit later, but um, her, her words definitely came to pass. So he returns a few times to see, uh, well, this is Vladimir, and he returns many times to see her and writes about everything that she describes to him. And one of the main things that she says in the first book is this quote here. He asks her, what do you think awaits our civilization? And she replies, in the long term, a realization of the futility of the technocratic path of development and a movement back to our pristine origins. And so that's a, that's a beautiful way to get started, right? Yes. And yeah, it's it's wonderful. And so that's a little preface about Anastasia. And by the way, she lives in complete harmony with the nature there in the taiga. There's a piece that her family has been taking care of for probably endless eons. All the bears and the wolves and everything there are they react to her and they help her. They bring her food. They do all kinds of things for her. The trees react to her. The birds react to her. Everything is connected to her so deeply in a way that we couldn't understand because we haven't grown up in something like that. But she is such an integral part of the nature there. And um, just wanted to add that in. So Anastasia and the Ringing Cedar's vision of education. What does somebody like her who has lived this pristine way of life and preserved all this wisdom from day one of mankind have to say about education, right? So I wanted to start with something from book one where she talks about, I, I think establishing the proper attitude towards children is really important. And so she says, every new man is born a sovereign, a king. She says, nature and the mind of the universe have seen to it that every new man is born a sovereign, a king. He's like an angel, pure and undefiled. Through the still soft upper part of his head, he takes in a huge flood of information from the universe. The abilities inherent in each newborn child are such as to allow him to become the wisest creature in the universe, godlike. It takes him very little time to bestow grace and happiness upon his parents. During this period amounting to no more than nine earth years, he becomes aware of what constitutes creation and the meaning of human existence, and everything that he needs to accomplish this already exists. Only the parents should not distort the genuine, natural structure of creation by cutting the child off from the most perfect works in the universe, right? So every child is, is a sovereign, a king. He's like an angel. He can become the wisest creature in the universe, godlike. And these are these angelic children that we're bringing in. That's what they're like when they first come in. And so 
she talks about one's attitude to one's child. And she says, the thoughts surrounding the child, believe me and try to understand. Christ could only be born by a mother who believed that Christ would be born to her. And if the parents have the same attitude to their child as they would to Christ or Muhammad, their offspring will follow this thought. And he will become whoever he aspires to become. And people will still explore nature. And those who are able to feel and become aware of what the creator has created, its sense and its purpose, they will be able to make a bright and happy world for their child. And so this is such a paradigm shift. You know, if the parents have the same attitude to their child as they would to Christ or Muhammad, their offspring will follow this thought. And I know for a fact that before I read these books, I never thought about children in that way. Like, but it it just makes sense, right? Uh, very powerful. So moving on. And so here, here is what happens. We have this angelic sovereign child. And in our world, very, you know, strangely, um, well, not strangely, but unfortunately, uh, the world of technocracy does not allow parents to do the right thing, unfortunately. And so this child is born into the world. And he what he finds is this technocratic society full of artificial nonsense, toys and all kinds of things that make noise and distract him. Um, and he's taught to value these artificial creations and this artificial system. He wakes up in four walls. He can't go outside. He has no movement. And all there is is artificial things around him. And he gets wrapped up in blankets and moved around against his will. He can't do anything or decide anything for himself. So this sovereign, this king, this angel is now had all his freedom stripped from him. And he's been cut off from creation, frankly. And all he can do is cry and try to make sense of this situation. Why is all this happening? And this poor, beautiful, sovereign angel child he becomes an indigent slave and, and begins begging for handouts and his life is changed. And Anastasia says the system always operates through parents and through those who proclaim themselves to be wise teachers. And so why I say this is because we need to take responsibility for our actions. We've created this world, but we can create a new one too, where the child doesn't have to go through this. Right. And so this is where we're at in our life at the moment. Uh, maybe some people are not there, but as a society, we find ourselves there. So where do we find ourselves? And mankind is ever looking for a perfect system of raising children and endeavors to seek out the wisest teachers and then hands over its children to be raised by them. And here's something that these are all quotes from Vladimir. And he says, lack of trust and fear of making a mistake are what make people hand over their children to schools and academies so that afterward they can blame the teachers, anyone but themselves. And it's tough because we really got to take a look at how we're living, right? This all starts with how we're living in the society that we live in before we can talk about education. It's about us and our lives. And she says, it's sad, Vladimir, that people have got into the habit of handing over their children to others to be raised. They simply hand their children over, often not knowing what kind of worldview will be inculcated in them or what destiny awaits them as a result of somebody's particular teaching. By giving over their children to an uncertain future, they're actually depriving themselves of their own children. Such a tragedy. And that is why children who mothers hand over to someone else to be taught often forget their mothers in turn. And that's where we find ourselves at the moment. But good news is that there's an answer. So the question that we start with is how do we live? How are we living right now as a society? And how do we fix all these things that I just talked about in these previous slides? Where do, how do we change this culture of life that we find ourselves in? And Vladimir says in, in the fifth book, he says, a child's education begins with your own education, with setting up a happy existence for yourself and with your own attempts to get in touch with God's thoughts. And one of the principal points in this education is precisely the setting up of a splendid kin's domain. And so education all starts with our life. It's our happy existence that becomes the model for how our children are, are raised and educated and, and all these things. And so if we're not happy, we're not going to be able to show them how to be happy and how to live free and all those things. And we need to set up our life first before we, we do anything, right? And so what is a kin's domain? What is the splendid kin's domain? You can see in this picture here what it kind of is. It's an artistic representation, but let's go for it. So kin's domains, I'm going to spend a little bit of time talking about this because it's very important to understand the lifestyle of the ringing cedars. So this is the main idea in the ringing cedars is this kin's domain. 
It's a two and a half acre piece of the earth where your family creates a living paradise garden home for themselves and either their current or future children to pass on in perpetuity. It's your connection to God and the universe, and it's the space of your family for generations to come forever. Um, this It's the space of your kin, past, present, and future. You decide, I'm going to take this little piece of land here. I'm going to settle my family family line here. And, um, you know, eventually people from your family are reincarnated in that spot if you want to go there. And um, in general, we view them as a solution to world crisis because here is representation here on the left, like a little artistic thing. And then on the right here, these are actual kin's domains that people are building in Russia. Each of these little squares here is somebody's domain. And so let's go more into what a domain actually is. So this is a really well-designed permaculture design of two and a half acres and what you can do with it. But it's, you know, Anastasia's recommendations are it's a multicolored hedge, a multicolored living fence that's fencing out the whole thing. 50 to 75% of it is reserved of for a forest of a variety of trees. Um, you plant uh, on the edge of the forest, you plant some plants so that uh, animals can't get in and they trample the garden. And you have all, all kinds of things, right? You set up a, a pen for, for a goat and some chickens, um, a 16 meter approximately pond, raspberry and currant bushes in the forest, some log beehives for bees. You can make a gazebo out of trees, living trees. You can make a summer sleeping area as well out of living things, a little workshop, all out of living things. And what she, what Vladimir says to her, is like, it's not going to be a forest, but it's a palace. And she says, only the palace will be a living entity and continue to grow in perpetuity. This is how the creator himself thought up the whole balance of things. Everything around you is charged with the task of cherishing and delighting you and your children, cherishing and feeding them. And so why I'm talking about this now is that it, before we can even talk about the raising of children or education, think about the environment in which we're doing it. Is it within four limiting walls where this angel and this sovereign can't be free? Or is it in something like this? where this child can interact with God's creations in an in infinite variety and, and live in a clean and pure place that's uplifting and nourishing to the soul and to the spirit, right? And if we can't get there, then let's make steps to get there, right? Because how, how are we going to live? We have the technocratic path of development and we have the biological way that God created. And there's only two paths and which path are we going to walk down, right? And so... So when you have a bunch of domains together, you get what's called a kin's domain settlement. And this is where the whole idea of this new civilization comes from. So it is a settlement, is, is a bunch of individual two and a half acre domains together. In Russia, there's over 1,500 of these in just Russia alone. Uh, in the This is a, a map on the left side of settlements that have been reported to the Russian Anastasia Foundation. And this is just, it's that's not all of them. Um, and so the largest settlements are 300 plus families, each with a two and a half acre domain. The smallest ones are around 10. And there's a big range in between there. And so this is what Edith was talking about in the beginning. This is where the children can grow up, abundant acreage, people who care for them, the schools of the future, um, all of this Stuff. Each family, if we go back, is is planting so many trees. They are doing so much to to take care of themselves and and their own self sufficiency, right? They imagine. I, I know a family who we interviewed. They plant four hundred trees a year on their domain, and they've been doing that for like five years. And imagine all the the families who are doing that. Imagine the abundance and beautiful, clean uh, environment that a child can grow up in. And anyway, so what happens is readers of the books get together and they form these settlements all across the world. And uh, there's, it's a beginning to emerge in the United States and Canada. That's what we're doing is bringing together all the readers who want to do this. And um, this is the new civilization, right? So why, why did I talk about all this? Because Growing up in the cradle of, of the creator, Vladimir tells us in the books, he says, you can't replace the perceptions a person can receive in the first years of his life while living in harmony with the great world of the creator, not through exerting effort or straining himself, but conversely through playing. There are no school lessons or university lectures at all that can replicate this. And I put this picture here because it's like, I know for a fact as a child, 
I never walked around my land like that as a baby. And this is a, a picture of a real baby from a real kin's domain settlement. And this is how this child is living. And all children deserve a shot at living like that. God's world is so infinite and perfect, and it's just there. And we just need to give it to our kids so that way they can grow up the way that God intended us to grow up, right? Um, and they learn through through playing and interacting with this beautiful world. And uh, this world, in turn, takes care of them and nourishes them. And so I want to compare something here. God's thoughts and man's thoughts. Um, so in the Ringing Cedars, they talk about all objects which we can see with our eyes, whether they're biological or they are manufactured, they are, in one way or another, they are materialized thoughts. Nature is the materialized thoughts of God, and everything that we have created is man's materialized thoughts. And so nature was formed by God's thoughts. All of our creations are formed by our thoughts, and children come into contact with these thoughts. And the difference, there's a big difference between the thoughts that make up something like these little building blocks here on the left and what we see here on the right, which is this beautiful, perfect hummingbird. And what is it that our children are going to be interacting with, right? Is it something that is comprised by a very basic and primitive thought? Or is it something that is infinitely perfect and impossible to describe, right? Uh, like, like a hummingbird or the world of nature. And so the thoughts that our children communicate with. So it turns out that one child comes into contact with an object comprising a primitive thought while the other communicates with an object created by God. And the vast discrepancy between the, the objects the children communicate with means that the speed of their thinking will be vastly different. So the speed of thinking, right? Like, I don't know what kind of upward development of thought that these little blocks here on the left would bring, but I know for a fact that a child is going to get infinitely more from interacting with nature, right? So what is speed of thinking? What are we talking about here when we're talking about interacting with objects and the discrepancy and the speed of thinking? So what is speed of thinking? Why is that important? And so the speed of thinking is the most important subject that we could be talking about when it comes to learning and education and maybe our life. And so you'd have to think, Again, you compare those blocks to that hummingbird. Um, the speed of thinking of the person who created those blocks is pretty low, but the speed of thinking of the one who created the hummingbird and all of nature is unbelievably, unfathomably high. And for example, expressions such as slow witted or with you, it takes a long time to sink in. What does this mean? Like it means that it's boring to talk with somebody whose thought operates at a, a slower speed. It's difficult. And so there's people who get things very quickly and their thought moves quickly. And there's people who get things slowly. And there's an infinite range on this spectrum here of slow and fast. And God is all the way at the top of fast thinking because he thought of the entire universe and manifested it. And so that's why I'm talking about interacting with God's world will accelerate the speed of thinking of the children because that's what they're coming in contact with, right? And so a little example here is Anastasia's grandfather says, let's imagine all the people on the earth are given a problem that takes a thousand years to solve. They start working on it. But one man has three times the speed of thinking of the others. That means he will know all the intermediate decisions of mankind before everyone else. What takes humanity 900 years to work out, he will solve in 300 and that means for 600 years, if he chose to, he'd be in a position to control and direct the actions of other people. He got there three times faster than everyone else. And so it's it's really important to think that developing the speed of thinking of our children and of ourselves as well is, is super important because they will be able to comprehend things quicker, be able to be more creative and be faster and and all these things, right? And we can talk about the world that we live in and how it's completely designed to stop the operation of our thought. Everything, TV, the, the poison that people take in through their bodies, the media, just this crazy culture, school, public school, does all these things to shut down people's thought and creativity and to slow down their thinking, basically to the point where, um, to the point where people aren't even thinking at all. It just brings thought to a standstill. 
And the ideology behind the ringing cedars is the exact opposite, doing everything you possibly can to make your child's thinking quicker, right? That's so important. Um, and so you take a look at the lifestyle of the majority of people of our time, you see the multitude of efforts directed at stopping the operation of your thought. Um, Anastasia talks about how even a small child should not be distracted from what he's doing. In other words, the operation of his thought should not be stopped. Children shouldn't be like interrupted and, and stopped from their contemplation, especially of the natural world, because during that time, they are analyzing things and thinking of things and creating inside their minds and their and their thoughts start accelerating and gaining momentum and they're just going. Um, and so this is all from Anastasia's grandfather. He says, then she showed you a series of exercises aimed at accelerating a child's thought. And she she talked about how education as we see it, as the Vedrus people see it, as her family line sees it, begins with the correct presentation of questions to the child. And so why questions, right? Education as we see it begins with the correct presentation of questions to the child. When a child is presented with a question, his thought begins to search for the answer and thereby gains more and more momentum. This means that the speed of his thinking is increasing minute by minute. And by the time he's 11, it will be many, many times faster than that of someone raised under a system designed to slow thought down. And so that's something really to take in there because children we have to activate their their thinking and get them searching and and accelerate the speed of their thought right gaining more and more momentum and a child imagine like he says here goes through 11 years of this where his thought never slows down for a moment this child is going to become a genius and that's the kind of children we rightfully should have right and so anastasia gives a lot of great advice in the first book especially about how to ask questions to your child. And so this is a really important thing. She says, first of all, you should ask him to help you. Only ask him in all seriousness without any pandering, especially since he'll actually be able to offer you assistance. If you do any planting in your garden, for example, ask him to hold the seeds in preparation for sowing or rake out the seed beds or have him put a seed into the hole you've prepared. And in the process, talk to him about what you're doing, something like this. We will be putting the little seed into the ground and covering it with earth. When the sun in the sky shines and warms the earth, the little seed will get warm and start to grow. It will want to see the sun and a little shoot will poke its head out of the earth just like this one. At this point, you can show him some little blade of grass. And if the seed likes the sunshine, it'll grow bigger and bigger and maybe turn into a tree or something similar or something smaller like a flower. And I want, I want it to bring you tasty fruit. And if you will, uh, you will eat it. If you like it, the little shoot will prepare its fruit for you. And actually this picture here on the right is a real woman on a Kim's domain settlement in Russia planting cedar trees with her kid. So that's a beautiful thing. Um, but she says, you need to talk with him as an equal. You should bear in mind the thought that he's superior to you in some respects and the purity of his thought. For example, he's an angel. If you succeed in understanding that, you can proceed intuitively and your child will indeed become a person who will happify your days. And she says, in general, it's very important to know how to ask your child questions. Um, and so the next year you can offer your child his own seed bed, fix it up and give him the freedom to do whatever he likes with it. Don't ever compel him by force to do anything with it and don't correct what he's done. You can simply ask him what he likes. You can offer help but only after asking his permission to work along with him. And you can see like her perspective is such respect and freedom and autonomy for the child and his thinking that don't do anything without his permission. Don't compel him to do it. Ask him what he likes and just try to help him with that. The main thing is that the child is starting to think and analyze and cells are awakening in his brain, which will operate throughout his life. They will make him brighter and more talented compared to those whose corresponding cells are still dormant. And so this is the same kid, he's planting trees, it's, it's cute. And she says, as far as civilized life goes, what you call progress, he may well turn out to be superior in any field of endeavor, all the more so since the purity of his thought will make him an exceptionally happy person. Um, and she's talking about the children establish 
contact with their planets through interacting with nature, being out under the stars, interacting and gardening and things like that. And she says, outwardly, he will look like everyone else, but inwardly, this is the kind of man you call a genius. And when she says man, she means the living soul, uh, not the gender of man or woman, uh, the, the consciousness of, of a spirit. So there, there's so many things about the asking questions as well. Um, there's a lot of stories in the books where she's asking questions to her son, her grandfathers are asking questions to her. And they ask her things that really make her think like um, they're asking her about like she she's starting to discover what her soul is and how to feel her soul. And, and they ask her the whole we, we know that all the animals in the world want the warmth and embrace of, of man and his grace and his light and everything. But you only have this little body. Like, how could you embrace the whole world with your kindness and your warmth? And things like that and they ask her this question and she has to think about it for like a month she's like four years old when they ask her this question and her grandfathers don't ask her another question for an entire month and they wait for her to answer this question and eventually she comes back and she says i discover that i have this other self that isn't my body and that self is infinite and it can touch everything and she says but i don't know what to call it or what to do with it or anything like that and her grandfather says that's your soul listen to your soul and try to embrace the whole world with it. And there's so many stories about that. I know I didn't give specific, more specific examples about asking questions, but like she says, the main thing is to, you know, talk with your child as an equal and um, it, you can proceed intuitively uh, after a certain point, you know, you'll, you'll figure it out. Just having that right attitude, I think is very important. So she also talks about, having an accurate history of mankind and our children understanding where we come from and who we actually are and where we find ourselves is very important to their education as well. So I want to walk you through her history of mankind, these three images of history that she shares with us here. And so the first image is um, the first picture ought to show history as it actually was. It ought to show a happy family, a family of happy people, a look on their faces expressing both intelligence and childlike purity and love on the faces of both parents. Human bodies in harmony with their surroundings, striking in their beauty and graceful in their power of spirit. A flourishing garden all around, creatures always on the alert to render service with gratitude. Because right before she gets into this in the books, she's talking about how the other view of history is basically that we come from you know, primitive man, he's a, a monkey, senseless being who scrambled around for food and couldn't figure anything out for himself. And then eventually they started making metal and things. And, you know, they they started um, fighting with each other and wars and stuff. And people became kings and they started to build up their little civilization. And this is a measure of progress. And then eventually now her, that third image is we have modern man who is modern and sophisticated and there's like a man in a suit and he's so intelligent and all these things and that we have done this upward ascent from our original barbarity to our wonderfully civilized civilization that we are now. And she's saying that's entirely false and children suffer under that false notion. So she's correcting this by saying that we come from God people who were happy and lived in complete harmony with nature um, everything was flourishing around them and they were happy like this picture here. Right. And so this is our origin. And the next thing is people started fighting. The second picture too should present to children an image of historical fact, two armies in monstrous armor rushing at each other, their commanders standing on a height of land being entreated by priests. Some of their faces show fear and disorientation while others of those after yielding to the priests entreaties, are inflamed with a beastly fanaticism. In just a moment, a sense of slaughter will begin. People will start killing their own kind. So we're definitely progressing downhill from here. Wait until the next one. And here's where we find ourselves. The third picture shows people in today's world. We should see a group of people of pale and sickly countenance in a room filled with an array of artificial things. Some have extremely obese figures. Others are bent over. Faces are full of heaviness and gloom. The kinds of faces you see on most passers-by along big city sidewalks. 
Through the window, one can see cars exploding on the street and dirty ashes raining down from the sky. And this is the accurate picture of history of, of, of mankind, very briefly stated. And she says, all three of these true pictures of history should be shown to the child. And the question asked, which of these lifestyles would you like to live? The child should know the whole history of the human race without misleading distortions. Only after that can his actual education begin. The question should be asked to the child, how can we change the situation today? Just a single sincerely asked question together with the parent's desire to hear their child's answer is capable of uniting parents with their children, of making them happy forever. And it's a powerful thing because the children, they're pure, they're angels, like Anastasia said, and we should be asking them where we should be going. We should show them the true history of everything, like she says, and we should ask them, what do they want? And we're going to hope and pray, obviously, that they're going to pick the first image that we just talked about here. And they're going to show us how to get back there because they know and uh, they, they can help us and they're going to do that. Um, and so only after knowing the true history of the human race can his actual education begin. And so now I want to switch topics and talk about the forest school of Mikhail Shetinin, who is praised and talked about by Anastasia and Vladimir Magri in the books here. And this is the school that Edith was mentioning in our beginning. And why we're talking about this school is that Vladimir wanted to see an example of all of Anastasia's educational principles in practice. And Anastasia showed him this school and, and described all this and showed him images. And he went there and he visited and interacted um, with um, Mikhail Shatinin, who has passed away, and his students there in his school. And so first, I want to show you what this incredible school looks like. This is the grounds of the school. This school, as Edith said, um, was entirely designed, um, built, painted. Every nook and cranny of the school is designed by the children. Look at this. I've never seen a school like this in my life. I've barely seen a religious temple that looks this beautiful on, on the inside. And they, what they do there is they study about 10 years of material in one year. Um, as Edith said, they can get master's degrees by age 17. It's a public you know, uh, it's a public Russian school, so it's actually free, no tuition. There's a super long wait list there. Well, actually, when it was operating, it, it shut down a couple of years ago after many decades of thriving. Um, won't get into that. But here are some more pictures of what these children have created. I mean, they're, I mean, the creativity is unbelievable. I have never seen anything like this. And so we continue. Here's some of the children outside. They're learning Russian martial arts. This, These are all their classrooms, uh, by the way. Like these temple places are are their classrooms. Here, here are some kids on the right in another room uh, with lots of paintings and things that you, you can't see. But all of this is designed and built by the children. And um, this is a very special campus that they have there. And so... Who would even think of the idea to let children do that? You know, they have some supervision from adults, but this is what children can do when they are just given freedom, right? Look at the master level of, of painting and architecture that has gone into this. It's unbelievable. And so I want to talk about Shatinin's philosophy because his philosophy is incredible and uh, there's a lot that we can learn. Um, and so the, the children learn and they teach the other students. They're, they are mainly responsible for their education. The, the teachers there are mainly seen as guides and facilitators. And there isn't this idea of the teacher is teaching and sticking information into the mind of the child. Um, and so Shatinan says it's very important that, they, that what they do should have a direct effect on the people around them. And now they're studying not for themselves. That's very important. They're concerned about how to share what they're learning with others. Marks, grades aren't important to them. They know that in a few days, they will have to explain it all to someone else. And so he says the degree of openness in their relationships is important. Their field elements, their invisible field energy information will then be able to share information with each other once they have this openness in their relationships 
And he says, you can see the whole point here is to make children feel free and unencumbered. This is a place where they can ask any question, get up and come and go as they please. Maintaining relationships is the important thing. And so again, it's like this respect for the children, right? It's ask any question, get up, come and go as they please, feel safe, feel able to share, right? It's all about sincerity and openness. It's a beautiful thing. And so continuing on here, this is a quote from him that I love. And this is a, a close up of one of the murals on the wall in, in, this, in the classroom here. He says, if a child's heart is open, he is a genius. When you open his heart and remove all of his complexes, all tension and anxiety, then you will see a genius that's already on his own path. And that's so beautiful because there isn't some IQ test or something that determines that a child is a genius. It's, is this child on his path? Is his heart open? Is he expressing what's inside of him? Is she expressing what's inside of her? And that's really what it is. And that's what we are responsible for is giving children that environment where they can feel free and feel open and express that innate genius that they have within them because they have divinity within them. They are a sovereign. They are a king. They're an angel. And our job is to preserve their purity and not add whatever dogma we have <laughs> to it. Don't put their fire out because their fire is, is burning. So he talks a lot about solving problems. And this is very interesting. He says, our collective ancestral memory has knowledge of the laws of the cosmos, as well as techniques for living in cosmic space. So it's very important to reject any suggestion that there's something they don't know. If one of those doing the explaining entertains such a thought, his pupils will not know it. And so what they're what he is saying is that our our children can get their answers from the universe if we don't distract their ability to do so, because they're they're launching out their thoughts into space and they're seeking an answer. And as long as we don't tell them that they can't get an answer, eventually they can. Um, and so don't tell them that they don't know something because they have it within them and they the universe will provide that answer to them. And so he says, the explainer's basic task is to enter into a relationship with his pupils focused on solving problems. Then the learning process takes place all by itself. So it's not to distract them with attention to the actual learning or memorization. The thought of somebody out there teaching has to be rejected. So he says the principal thing is to enter into a relationship with his pupils focused on solving problems and then the all the memorization and learning and everything that happens with it will happen naturally because you're focused on solving a problem and it'll all just be kind of lumped into that process he says as they work together the consciousness of a of a dividing line between teacher and pupil is obliterated the problem solving process brings with it the necessary knowledge what actually takes place is a recalling of things forgotten. This is the reflex arc, you know, as in Pavlov, the stimulus reaction. And so he's saying that this, again, the, everything that they need to know is within them or outside of them. And the, the process of solving problems, of getting their thought searching, right? Like asking questions like we were talking about it, the children's thinking begins to work and it eventually finds everything they need right and their the job is to let them feel safe to do that and so he talks about motivation and considerable emphasis is laid on motivation the idea of service to others these are all quotes from him by the way everything i'm reading are direct quotes from him from the ringing cedars books he says considerable emphasis is laid on motivation the idea of service to others and if they learn anything they learn to understand the soul the aspirations and the thoughts of another individual, because these children, they all live together. They are taking classes together and doing all these things together. And he's teaching them how to be attentive to each other. And he says, it's not the mathematics that's important here, but rather man learning mathematics. It's not math for its own sake, but maths for the sake of progress towards truth. And the more powerful this for the sake of motive is, the more successful will be one's immersion into a field of knowledge. So he's saying children need to have some motivating factor of what they're learning and where they're going to apply it and why. And that will help them be successful in what they're learning and to fully absorb things. 
So Anastasia talks about this as well. I forget which book this is from, but um, she says only when a child not simply attends the classes, but actually comprehends where he will apply the knowledge received. When instruction proves too grueling for the pupil, it can be counterproductive. When a man has a specific goal that can be mastered through the study of various disciplines, learning for him becomes an exhilaration and the assimilation of knowledge proceeds a hundred times faster. So if the children know, for example, like if they have some vision of, I want to become this kind of person and becoming this kind of person requires me learning all of these different things. Well, they're going to be motivated to learn those things and they're going to ab absorb it much faster, right? They have a, a deep motivation that propels them to, to learn and absorb knowledge. And it's super important. And Shatinan focuses a lot on it. And so does Anastasia. And so there's one more thing here about his philosophy. And he talks about words and the power of words. And he says, that's wrong is a phrase we never use. In the old Russian language, there's no stoppage of motion and no bad words. Again, this idea of not stopping the children's thought, not getting in the way. He says, there's no stoppage of motion and no bad words. In ancient times, people, no matter what their ethnic affiliation, never used a bad word in reference to anything. It simply doesn't exist. So why pay attention to it? What is bad does not exist. If you find yourself at a dead end, then the words you would use to get out of that dead end would be phrases like turn right, turn left, climb up, hinting at which way one should go, but not snapping, you're standing the wrong way, right? It's useless. It doesn't contribute anything. So why do it? Just find some other way of, of saying it and getting people on the right track. So he says, so people who work with them, our children, should have a deep vocabulary range, which excludes thought distracting incidental words. And he says, words warmed by feelings have special significance. And so that's such a powerful thing because in our culture, from when we're little, we're told to point out mistakes and what's wrong and this is wrong, 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 everything is wrong. But it's so pointless because it doesn't tell you which direction is right or get you towards a solution. And we have to deprogram ourselves from thinking like that. I know I'm still working on it myself and I think everybody's here on that journey. But um, this whole idea of stoppage of motion, it just it just switches off our thinking. It's like our thinking, we're trying to find a solution and boom, dead end, uh, right? Like that's wrong, just stops everything. It doesn't continue the flow of energy and the searching for solutions, right? And so that's such a big thing is not getting in the way of our thoughts, the thoughts of our children, um, just always trying to keep it going, looking for something. Right. So a deep vocabulary range is important. I know I still need to develop it myself. And so um, at the end of this, Anastasia is saying, Shatin in school is indeed marvelous. And it's a step towards the schools where children in the new communities will study. The pupils who have gone through Shatin in school will help them build and uh, will help build them and teach in them. But wise and educated teachers are not the only principal component here. Parents will also be teaching their children in these new schools. And at the same time, they will learn from their children. She's talking about schools on kin's domain settlements. And this picture here in the background is actually a, a husband and wife on their beautiful kin's domain in Russia. So this is a real garden that you're looking at that somebody, husband and wife in love, planted um, and gave birth to children on. It's a beautiful thing. And so she says, the study of sciences and other subjects should not be considered an end in itself, a primary goal. It's much more important to learn how to be happy. And that is something only the parents can show by their example. That's their role. And so we, we come back to the beginning here of like, we're talking about education. We're talking about raising children. We, we want our children to be happy and noble and free and courageous and they grow up inside of four walls and they're told everything they do is wrong and they're limited, right? It's like, how, how are we living? Uh, are we living in a place that is going to nourish the spirits and the mind? All right. Sorry for the little technical glitch, my friends. So what I wanted to say, and this is a quote from Anastasia. We just got done talking about Shatin in school and his philosophy and everything. And she says that Shatin in school is indeed marvelous. 
it's a step towards the schools where the children in the new communities will study. And when she talks about new communities, she's talking about these kin's domain settlements, which I mentioned earlier. And this picture right here actually is uh, an image of a husband and wife in Russia who have created their kin's domain. This is it right here that you're looking at, this beautiful flourishing garden. They built this log home with their own hands. I wish I had more pictures to show you, actually. But um, this is a happy husband and wife, and this is where the the schools of the future will be. And so <clears throat> she says, the, the pupils who have gone through Shatin in school will help build them and teach in them. Uh, but wise and educated teachers are not the only principal component here. Parents will also be teaching their children in these new schools. And at the same time, they will learn from their children. And a little departure from that is that I went to Russia in 2016 to one of the largest Kins Domain settlements that has been there 25 years now. And they've born a lot of children and they have schools there and all these things that we're talking about here. And the parents do teach in the schools. And, and why I'm saying this and why it's significant is because she said this in like 1996, this quote. And so we're talking about 2016 when I went there. This is happening. Everything she said came true. And it's happening on a large scale. The, the Exactly what she said here has happened. The pupils who went through Shatin in school have helped build and establish these schools on the new Kins Domain settlements in Russia and hundreds of schools across the country. And, you know, outside too, like we did an event with a bunch of teachers from Shatin in school uh, and we did a big Zoom thing with them and other schools that were all influenced by him and, and all this has happened, right? So just a, a little comparison here. So uh, parents will also be teaching their children in these new schools. And at the same time, they will learn from their children. And all this is happening right now in real life. And she says, the study of sciences and other subjects should not be considered an end in itself, a primary goal. It is much more important to learn how to be happy. That is something only the parents can show by their example. That is their role. And so we come back to the beginning here, right? We come back full circle about where do we start? How does education start? How does child raising start? And it's about we ourselves learning how to live a happy life and being an example. And so elsewhere in the Ringing Cedars books, it says uh, raising children is raising yourself. Raising children is raising yourself. And we have to take a good look at ourselves and say, are we where we want to be? Am I happy? And if I'm not happy, do I know what's preventing me from being happy? At least, right? Um, can I do something now to make my life happy and to manifest my dreams? Can I take a step towards that? Because truly, it's our example that the kids are going to learn from. And we're, we're talking about happiness. It's like living in harmony with God and his creation through something like, you know, ideally a kin's domain where why is it two and a half acres? I know I didn't explain that. It's because you're supposed to have a direct interaction with every little blade of grass and every flower and everything that's growing on that land. And two and a half acres is around the sweet spot um, to where you can do that personally without having to bring in other people or it being too difficult to manage. And so having a di direct connection with all the nature around us, like this husband and wife here, Look at they planted and they built all this themselves and look how beautiful that is and the happiness that they've created around them, right? And Anastasia talks about you take the love that you feel in your heart between you and this other person and you give it an out external manifestation in your kin's domain and the nature around you. You plant all these trees inspired by that love and now you've manifested something eternal. And she says a husband and a wife, he, Vladimir says actually, a husband and a wife who have created a kin's domain are infinitely more spiritual than the most celebrated wise man who just talks about spirituality because they have taken their spirituality and they have manifested it. They have taken all these good and virtuous things that they feel within themselves and they don't talk. They have done it. They have manifested a paradise around themselves. They have manifested something good, true and beautiful and lasting and they're bringing their children into it and they've done something very significant that God smiles on right? And so the people who are living this way are really blessed. And so it's up to us to learn how to be happy. And that's something that only we can show our children by our example. And so I want to end this with a quote from Vladimir. And he says, 
Perhaps we should give our children the freedom to grow up without our dogma and then ask the children where and which way we should go. Anastasia talks about how children whom we have not corrupted spiritually will find the way to winning salvation for both themselves and us, or rather to attain the paradise given us right from the beginning. And so let's give our children the freedom to grow up without our dogma that we unfortunately were born into. Let's ask them which way we should go. Let's treat them like the angels and the kings and queens that they are, these pure, beautiful beings. Let's make sure that we preserve their purity and let's help their thoughts grow and accelerate and find new things and express their inner genius. Like Shatinan said, a, a child whose heart is open and free is a genius, right? And to keep all that and, and protect them from the harmful influences of this world. Because this system that we find ourselves in is constantly trying to barrage people and to get through to them and to destroy us from our inside. And it's our job to protect the kids and to keep their purity and to keep their thoughts good and clean and searching and, and you know, all, all these things. We, we're truly responsible for them. And, you know, children whom we've not, not corrupted spiritually will find the way to winning salvation for both themselves and us and attain the paradise given us right from the beginning. And so this is another picture, by the way, from a happy family on their kin's domain in Russia. And just all these kids deserve a happy life. Man. I hope this was inspiring for you. I know I had to move fast here and I did my best to cover a lot of information. If you want to learn more, if you want to dive deeper into these ideas, I did my best to sum up 10 books of knowledge in a one hour presentation. And um, I would suggest that you go and read or reread the Ringing Cedars of Russia series. We have the books online if you want to get them in PDF form and print them out. Unfortunately, they're out of print at the moment. We're working with Vladimir to begin publishing them again. So that's going to be exciting. So you go to Anastasia.Foundation, sign up for the email list, stay tuned, join our community. Like I said, we've got the largest community in the world. We have people in all the states, all the countries, everywhere. So if you want to meet people like this, you want to meet people near you, join our groups. We have Telegram. We have our own social network. We're going to have a phone app. We have Facebook, giant email list, YouTube channel, everything we do, all kinds of Zoom events all the time. Um, we're doing a lot of stuff. You can meet people near you, other parents and other people and make friends and, and live this way, manifest your dreams. And so this is just the beginning too. We're at the beginning of a giant movement that's really about to go nuts in the Western world once we republish the books. And this little piece of text here on the bottom right, I don't know if you can see it very well, but this is my last email I got from Vladimir McGree, which was really inspiring for me, which I want to share with you. And he says, um, he said, Gabriel, I intuitively feel that you could create a large and powerful community in the English speaking countries. It could present the world with a new paradigm for overcoming the crisis. The correctness of my assumptions has been proven in practice. In all countries where I've ever spoken to readers, they've expressed their desire to create and be friends. I'm grateful to you that you feel the situation well and are able to do a great deal for all the people in the world. And that's what we're doing is we're connecting everybody who wants to live this way. And um, I really encourage you to go read the books. I really encourage you, welcome you into our, our community with open arms. The best people in the world are in our community. Dr. Edith is in our community. And, and so many people like uh, Dr. Edith. And so thank you, friends, for giving me this opportunity and giving me this time. Uh, I really hope that what I shared here was valuable and, and touched you and added something to your life. So thank you. Oh, my goodness, Gabriel. Thank you so much. What a potent and powerful soul aligning presentation you did today. So deeply grateful for the experience, the transmission that came through you. I can just feel that the audience listening, we want to dive deeper. So you would recommend step one, read the books. But Absolutely. also for those of us that really want to focus on the education and family piece, would yep. you be open to doing some deeper dive sessions, a follow-up series of training for the people that are interested? Let's do it. Amazing. Okay. So you guys, let me know if you're interested. We'll, we'll build something because this was so rich, so powerful, so juicy. Let's dive deeper into this work. This is maybe the most potent work there is to do right now. Yeah. 
And, and you know, there is so much to do and it's just, let's be kind and understand that we grew up in this world. We inherited this, right? You know, let's just be kind to ourselves along the journey because there's a lot to do and we're never going to be, you know, what is perfect, right? I say perfect is just the direction towards perfection. If you're on that path, then you're, you're perfect. Thank you so much, Gabriel. What a powerful presentation. So much gratitude. Thank yeah, you. Yeah, I, I, I moved fast. There was a lot to say, so I really hope it landed. Yeah, thank you guys.